Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I'm very pleased to meet uh, this uh, ERF uh, network here. Um, one of the questions that the organizers asked us when they invited us was uh, whether um, social justice and, and the evaluation of, of social welfare should be thought in terms of opportunities or in terms of achievements that people are, uh, are reaching. And so that's the question I'd like to, uh, to address here uh, with you. And what I'll do is first to um, explain that the idea of equalizing opportunities is not so simple and that different approaches have been developed to make it a bit more uh, precise and concrete. And I will uh, uh, discuss the challenges that this and the objections that this approach has, has met. And I, will, I would like to propose a slightly different perspective on how to think about uh, opportunities, which will have to do more with the uh, ideal of freedom as you'll see, and the ideal of respecting people's preferences. And then I'll uh, explain a bit, uh, also I will try to advertise, uh, uh, like my uh, predecessor here, a research program, uh, I'll try to discuss some concrete issues with implementing these, uh, these ideas. Um, so various approaches in the uh, analysis of equal opportunities. So the ideal of equalizing opportunities has a, an important uh, uh, history in political philosophy, but it has also a great deal of appeal in political debate. So many politicians, many people in public debates refer to equal opportunities as the obviously a nice ideal that every society should strive for. Now what are the approaches that have been uh, uh, developed to make, it, to make this uh, consensual but a bit vague notion uh, more precise? So one uh, approach that has been developed in particular by, by John Romer, who will uh, speak right after me here, is uh, uh, and also has been uh, implemented uh, in various uh, contexts, like in a, a special report of the World Bank, where uh, Francois, I think, has also played a big role, is a, a sort of pragmatic approach which looks at the origins of people, like for instance their social uh, origins or the education or income level of their parents, and looks at the average outcome, for instance their income or their education level or their health, uh, it looks at the average outcome of people uh, coming from different origins. This is very much like uh, what has been done in a related field, which is the analysis of disparity, for instance, the social disparities in health, uh, and where you have similar issues of standardization. What is nice about this empirical approach is that really there you don't just focus on uh, standard groups uh, like gender or racial uh, subgroups, but you look at uh, circumstances that may determine people's uh, situations in a more, uh, in a richer, uh, richer way. Even though, of course, uh, a key uh, limitation here is that the data are usually uh, uh, limiting and so it's hard to really uh, pin down people's circumstances in a very uh, precise way. Now the theorists, uh, especially in, in philosophy, have uh, argued that really if we want to be uh, completely clean about the uh, idea of equal opportunity, we should go for a notion of genuine opportunities. And what does that mean? Uh, so it's something like Think of these sets to which people, the sets of options in life to which people have access, like capability sets in Amartya Sen's uh, approach, or uh, what uh, Cohen uh, called access to advantage. So imagine you have these sets, and what real, uh, really matters is that people make true choices when they pick an option in these sets. And so the key element here is this idea that we should really look for uh, the true choices that people make and uh, we really identify all the constraints, all the determinants that may influence them when they make this choice because all these constraints will somehow shape and um, uh, limit their uh, opportunities. But there is another approach which is perhaps uh, slightly less obvious because usually when we think in terms of opportunities, we think of people making choices in the set. That's indeed very natural and it's close to, uh, to what uh, ordinary people would think about it. But the philosophers uh, John Rawls and Ronald Dworkin have proposed something a bit different, which is to think in terms of resources. So the term resources is a bit misleading because they were thinking of generic and uh, quite uh, uh, broad-ranging resources. Uh, and the idea was that resources would be offered to people and they could make use of these resources according to their life plans, their goals in life, their values. Uh, this approach is actually uh, historically uh, anterior to the, uh, the other approach in terms of genuine opportunities and it has been criticized for uh, fetishizing resources. That's a bit of a uh, misunderstanding because as I said, resources, especially in Dworkin's approach, can include 
all internal characteristics that people may have and, and that limit their, um, their opportunities. So it's a, a really deep, uh, deep notion. And it has also been criticized for uh, fetishizing, in a way, uh, preferences. Uh, the reason being that, of course, people's preferences um, are very often uh, influenced, determined, uh, shaped by their education, their upbringing, their social environment, and, and all that. So these are uh, some of the various approaches, but I also want to mention another difficulty, which has been more a kind of debate between the philosophers and the economists, actually. And um, the problem is what I, I like to call the reward problem. So when we talk about equalizing opportunities, it looks very nice, but what should the opportunities uh, be? And especially, uh, should we offer sets of options which are somehow flat, which means that no matter what you do, you get more or less the same outcome, or should they be steep, where you can really fail or uh, win a big prize if it's uh, uh, really a sort of very steep reward scheme. And here you have two approaches which have been uh, developed in parallel. One is what I call the liberal approach which says that essentially once you have uh, uh, el eliminated the inequalities that are due to people's uh, unequal circumstances, then intervention should stop. Then you should no longer try to intervene anymore. And uh, this uh, idea is, is inspired by the idea that, by the, the principle that perhaps we should be neutral with respect to the way people exercise their responsibility. So neutrality meaning, well, okay, we don't try to punish or reward uh, people having different choices in life, for instance. But there is another approach which has been more popular in some of the economics literature, um, which is uh, inspired by the uh, idea that in economics, when we talk about inequalities, uh, we have this notion of inequality aversion and the notion that we have people, uh, individuals having responsibility for what happens to them, it's quite natural to say, okay, let's try to have a strong inequality aversion for things, for inequalities that are due to circumstances for which people are not responsible and let's have a very weak or even no inequality aversion at all for the inequalities which are due to factors for which people are responsible, right? So that's another idea. So if you say zero inequality aversion, what does that mean? It just means you look at the total pi, the sum of the, or the average uh, value of the outcomes, and that's very much like what the utilitarians do when they compute the total of, of the uh, outcomes of people. In utilitarianism, it's usually total utility, but uh, it could be a total whatever outcome you want to look at when you define uh, opportunities. So these are the various approaches. Now the challenges. The challenges um, have been raised by various people and especially in philosophy because there is first a sort of normative problem here. When you talk about opportunities and equalizing opportunities, it has a bright side which is, yeah, it's nice to offer people opportunities and it has a dark side which is that once people have opportunities, whatever they do is their business and we don't care if they squander if they uh, screw up their situation, right? And so uh, some uh, people have said, oh, that's uh, a bit worrying because here we have some sort of uh, justification of a lack of solidarity toward the people who uh, fail to seize their opportunities. We have a sort of moralizing attitude. You should uh, take care of your opportunities and seize them. If you don't, that's your fault. And you have this encouragement or justification of a self-righteous attitude on behalf of the people who are the successful people, those who manage their opportunities well, they can essentially uh, have a contemptuous, uh, condescended attitude toward those who don't behave as well. So that's a sort of moral challenge. And another uh, challenge, which is again a bit philosophical, is that when you talk about people having opportunities and making choices, if you want to really be sure that they make genuine choices, well, you have to take account of the fact that we know, especially now with the development of, of social sciences, we know that people are influenced in so many ways that it's hard not to think of essentially our life being uh, the product of s many factors, many determinants, and um, where uh, genuine choice is essentially impossible to observe, perhaps doesn't even exist in a deep sense. Uh, so that's uh, the so-called free will problem. Now, if we Take that on board. If we say, yes, of course, genuine choice perhaps doesn't exist, or at least it's almost impossible to observe, um, the uh, uh, theorists of equal opportunity say, well, okay, that just means that equal opportunity then somehow reduces to equality of outcome, right? If there is no genuine choice, then uh, offering opportunities and offering outcomes will be more or less the same thing. And I think that's perhaps the most, the safest answer we should 
provide to this challenge, indeed, uh, it's probably better. And the empirical uh, illustrations that have been done, the empirical applications that have been done to measure inequalities of opportunities, the people have, the analysts uh, have usually been very clear that what they measure is a sort of lower bound on inequalities of opportunities because they just observe some of the elements of people's circumstances. They cannot observe everything. Mm -hmm. So it's just a lower bound, and it might be that the upper bound is not very different from uh, inequalities of outcomes. But now, suppose we uh, take that on board and we say, okay, let's look at, let's move from opportunities to something that is closer to outcomes. We still have the key problem of defining what the outcome should be. Uh, and that's uh, something that is uh, um, uh, interesting and where perhaps we can look again at the bright side of the idea of opportunity and say, remember, it looks nice to offer people's opportunities and one way to think of about that is that freedom is something that is a good motivation here. Amartya Sen in particular in his theory of capabilities has usually uh, talked much more about freedom than responsibility even though the two sides of the coin are, are there. And um, I would say that perhaps freedom should not be fetishized and we could perhaps criticize the capability approach for uh, saying, oh, freedom is very important, so then let us use a measurement in terms of capabilities, capability sets, as if freedom was the only thing that, that mattered. Um, so freedom is important and appears attractive all over the world, so it's not something that is really specific to any countries or cultures, uh, but it's probably too much to say that we should use freedom to just focus on, to, uh, as a justification for just focusing on opportunities, and perhaps it's, bet it's better to, to think of it as a component of well-being. So among the things that define well-being, one of these things is the extent of freedom that people have. So what does that mean concretely? How can we think of implementing this idea without falling back into the challenges that uh, were, were, uh, that were um, present when we talked of equality of opportunities? My proposal is to say perhaps what we should do is to take account of people's goals in life, their values, their preferences, and that can include actually uh, how much they care about having certain degrees of freedom, certain amount of choice uh, uh, activities in, in their life. So let's think in terms of respecting preferences. And that might be a way to uh, think anew about the issue of uh, what outcome we should, uh, we should equalize across people. Um, now, as you... Uh, probably know there is a big challenge to that uh, again because in welfare economics it's well known that there is this famous impo impossibility theorem of social choice uh, by Canaro which suggests that it's very hard to take account of people's preferences. So I won't go into the details here. I don't think we really we should be bothered too much by this theorem which relies on conditions which are very restrictive in terms of the information that we can use. What is clear and that's consensual in the field is that we need to be able to do interpersonal comparisons and uh, because without that we don't know who are the worst of people and who are the better of people. And what I would like to argue here is something that is not often recognized, which is that interpersonal comparisons are not an issue of empirical analysis. It's an issue of normative analysis. Deciding who is better off and who is worse off, that's not just an empirical issue, it's a normative issue, it's a fairness issue about uh, who, who deserves greater priority in, in society. And I'd like to give an example of how you can combine uh, these uh, fairness uh, considerations with the idea of respecting uh, preferences in a very uh, uh, simple way. So imagine that life is made of uh, two sorts of dimensions. One is just income, and the other is a multidimensional thing again, but it's quality of life, which may cover uh, many things like health, leisure, uh, social relations, and so on. And um, quality of life, which I will just denote uh, QOL here to make it things simpler in my slides. Let's imagine that we have two principles that we want to respect. The first principle is this idea of respecting preferences, and so that will be just, as you will see, very simple to implement, at least in theory. And the second principle is uh, the uh, idea of fairness, which will be just the following. When some people have the quality of life that corresponds to a certain standard or reference level, uh, which is QOL star in my slides here, uh, then the uh, uh, comparison between people can be made just in terms of income. 
the richer you are, the better off, provided that you are at this level of reference. If you are not at, the, at this level of reference, what does that mean? Well, perhaps you, you have to take into account people's preferences. Okay? You have to be careful. And it's very easy to understand why. Suppose you are talking about health. When people are in good health, supposing that this is a reference, it means then you can look at income to make comparisons. When they are not in good health, perhaps you should take account of their preferences. Some care more about health than others, and that might matter. And then comparisons in terms of income might not be, uh, might not be safe. Uh, so that's the idea. Okay, let's make comparisons in terms of income only for people having the reference quality of life. Now, I have a little theorem to offer here, which is very simple. If you take these two principles, then the comparisons you make between individuals must be in terms of equivalent incomes. And the reason is very simple. You have it, it's the last line here. When an individual has a certain situation made of a certain income and a certain quality of life, this individual is indifferent between that and another situation in which he or she has the reference uh, quality of life and some other level of income which uh, will be called the equivalent income. Okay? So if his actual quality of life is less than the reference, the equivalent income will typically be less than the ordinary income that corresponds to the willingness to pay to move from his actual quality of life to the reference quality of life. And you see, why will, uh, will we have to make the comparisons between people in terms of equivalent income? Because if you move people from this, their actual situation to the situation with reference quality of life and equivalent income, you are doing something that moves them along their indifference curve. So if we want to respect preferences, we have to say that they are just as well off as before, as in the initial situation. So that's uh, the use of the first principle, respecting preferences. But now, once you have imagined, you have put people in this hypothetical situation where everybody has the quality, the reference quality of life, then by the second principle, we can compare them in terms of income, which in that case is their equivalent income. So that's how the, uh, this very simple theorem is, uh, is proved. And therefore, I would like to uh, propose an implementation of this idea, which would go in, in the following way. You could measure social welfare as something that would be the average equivalent income times uh, 1 minus an inequality index. And the inequality index, as well, would bear on the distribution of, uh, of inequality incomes and would embody the degree of priority for the worse off that you want to put. And the equivalent income would take on board the uh, situation of people in terms of income and in terms of quality of life, and it would uh, uh, also take on board their preferences. And as you can see from the definition of equivalent income here, it's clear that if you raise, if you improve the situation of someone according to his or her preferences, that will necessarily raise the equivalent income. So the equivalent income is a sort of utility representation of people's situation, and therefore it uh, really respects uh, their preferences and, and really um, takes into account how they weight the various dimensions of, uh, of quality of life. So to give you an example of how a few applications of this uh, approach have been done, I just show uh, some recent results that the OECD has, has been producing using this approach for the OECD uh, countries. And here you, you see what you could get. You have the horizontal axis here is the um, uh, growth rate of uh, per capita GDP. And the vertical axis is the uh, growth rate on average uh, over this period, 95 to 2007 growth rate of what they call living standard, which are the, uh, the um, uh, equivalent incomes. And so what you see is that some countries are doing uh, better than others in terms of combination of, uh, of quality of life with, with income things. So the countries which are above the line have been doing a bit better in terms of quality of life uh, compared to the countries which are uh, below the line. And some people are worried about using this sort of data because it aggregates uh, many things together. Actually, here in this application, it doesn't aggregate too much. It's only about unemployment and longevity, life expectancy in this, in this country. So it's, it remains a bit limited. Uh, but what you can do is to keep track of the various components. And so the kind of uh, publication that you should have should really uh, record all the dimensions so that people still have information about the various uh, behavior of the dimensions. So here you have, I mean, it's hard to, to read in detail, but you have the, uh, the, the uh, crosses are the um, growth rates of the equivalent uh, incomes, so the living standards, and the red uh, squares, the red diamonds that you have in the middle correspond to the GDP things. And you have the various components in the colors uh, that uh, allow you to go from the uh, GDP, uh, the red diamonds, to the crosses, to the living standards growth rate. So this is just a, 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 an illustration. Of course, there are challenges to uh, doing this sort of um, 
uh, application. And one key challenge is to uh, have an idea of people's preferences, how to weight the various dimensions. And here you have different sources of information. None of them is perfect. And so my uh, proposal here is that we should try to combine them all as much as possible. One is revealed preferences when you look at people's behavior. Another source of, pref of information is uh, stated preferences. We can ask people questions about what they prefer. Uh, this method has been criticized a lot when contingent valuation of environmental issues has been done. Perhaps it's uh, slightly less um, uh, vulnerable to this criticism when you look at people's personal situation, but still, uh, it is not so easy to implement. And finally, something that has been popular lately is subjective well-being surveys, where you ask people, how satisfied are you with your life these days? That's a very simple question, not easy to answer. Uh, and people um, can give answers and we can also ask them about their objective situation in life and then you can do a regression of their um, subjective well-being on their objective conditions and you find something that might somehow reflect uh, their, um, the weight they put on various dimensions. Of course, there are many uh, difficulties and hurdles in these uh, econometric works, but that might be an interesting source of information as well. A challenge, uh, and let me also add to this that um, uh, the uh, idea of using surveys that include subjective well-being questions is giving us the prospect that just by sampling uh, the population doing surveys that combine subjective well-being and objective uh, conditions uh, questions might actually be a cheap way of getting a good, um, a good uh, uh, picture of the population situation, both in terms of quality of life, economic situation, and preferences. Uh, so I'm slightly perhaps less pessimistic than, than Francois was about, uh, about surveys. Uh, so it's, it's something that might be useful compared to national statistics, which are perhaps uh, a bit harder to uh, mobilize uh, in the direction of eliciting people's preferences. Now let me briefly mention another challenge. Um, I, I've been talking about preferences and people say, well, are preferences really respectable? Are they authentic? It's clear that uh, people's immediate preferences uh, are something that are very often shaped by social convention, social pressure, the adaptation to their situation, and in developing context, it's uh, particularly uh, a pressing issue. Um, and also, there has been a big challenge coming from behavioral studies, which show that people's preferences uh, seem to be inconsistent, uh, very easily manipulable by framing and so on, and especially for issues having to do with intertemporal choices or uh, risky uh, risk management, uh, it's uh, hard to really trust people's preferences. And so this is a serious challenge. I won't say much more about it, but I think this is an open uh, area for research. Uh, how can we get to something that is not just people's immediate and somehow uh, uh, shaky preferences to something a bit deeper and, and authentic? And what I would like to do to conclude my uh, presentation is to uh, uh, talk about the uh, extensions of this thing to, especially when we think of application to developing countries. Um, the example I've been given was limited to OECD uh, countries and the applications so far have been uh, limited to these countries, dealing with things like unemployment, life expectancy, leisure and family size. Um, now, if we think of developing countries, there are strong inequalities in developing countries about other things than that, like basic health care, basic public goods and infrastructure, and safe water, sanitation, and all that. All things which are taken for granted in the, in the context of develop, developed countries. So, uh, some work should be done to think of how to enrich the analysis to, uh, into that, that direction. And finally, uh, something that has been also uh, a bit of blind spot in the analysis so far is uh, social uh, issues. Uh, in people's, some of the uh, findings in the subjective well-being literature is that social relations seem to matter a lot to people, social status, uh, situation uh, with respect to family and friends and so on. Uh, and so it might be interesting to really put the focus a bit more on these issues, uh, issues of status, uh, autonomy at work and autonomy at home, gender issues in particular, uh, freedom, uh, the quality of institutions, the quality of social networks, all these things uh, appear to be uh, quite important, are not well measured, but perhaps again some uh, surveys might be uh, helpful here. So to briefly conclude, this is my last slide. Looking at opportunities, yes, it's better to look at inequalities opportunities than not looking at inequalities at all, uh, but uh, perhaps it's, it would be potentially misleading to just stop there. And so I think it's worth thinking in terms of identifying and respecting preferences, and um, it might be more uh, promising 
and perhaps uh, it's something that should matter a lot when we think of how people react. Why do people rebel? Perhaps because they really don't feel that they are uh, treated like they should and that they don't have what they uh, deeply want. Um, in a way, the idea here, uh, looking at preferences, might seem a bit like a luxury if you look back at the tradition of economics, which just focused on very objective things. Um, but in a way, it has to do with democrat democratizing uh, measures of social progress. We should not just uh, think of having some participatory forums where people would be able to express their views, but we should really, in a, in a more thorough sense, try to cater to people's values and goals in life. And that was I've, what I've been trying to advocate here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.